presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, you've heard it again and again, we're in the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression. Is it true? I talk with historian David Kennedy, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his book on the Great Depression. That's Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. My guest today didn't plan to be a historian. David Kennedy started out studying electrical engineering at Stanford, but a professor brought history alive for him and he was hooked. Today, Kennedy is himself a professor emeritus at his alma mater, where he's taught for more than 40 years. He's also the co-director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West, also at Stanford. Kennedy's works are known for synthesizing multiple aspects of a historical period, such as his book on the First World War and American society. It was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 1981. The prize was his in 2000 when his book on the Great Depression, Freedom from Fear, won a Pulitzer. Kennedy's also known for his commentary on issues of the day, such as his concern about what he sees as the growing chasm between civilian and military society. I spoke with Professor Kennedy about these and other issues at the Sun Valley Writers' Conference. Since 1995, the conference has been bringing together well-known and insightful authors to share their works. I started out by asking Dr. Kennedy how he defines his style of historical scholarship. I've heard it said, or perhaps written, that um, your type of history is, quote, good old-fashioned history. Uh, can you explain that a little bit? I, I assume that means you, you look at the, the, the big events and the big institutions and the big decisions that were made as opposed to honing in on a particular character or uh, what we might call identity history, a group of people. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I think the phrase good old fashioned history means a lot of things. Uh, I think it means fidelity to the narrative form, which is something I've believed in deeply since the start of my career. Meaning? That, that, that history is storytelling and we get this from as early as Thucydides and Herodotus who in, in fact, in his famous preface to the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, Thucydides apologized for the narrative form of what he was about to say, uh, about to write, uh, and said something to the effect that the absence of romance in my history will, I fear, detract somewhat from its interest. So he knew he was locked into the narrative form, but he couldn't make things up the way uh, Sophocles or Euripides or playwrights could and so on. So the, the narrative form, I think, is a good old-fashioned device that historians have used for thousands of years. Uh, and I suppose in our own time it also means a, a taste for the, the grand narrative and the grand synthesis uh, rather than narrow monographic studies of very, very narrowly defined topics. <clears throat> and I think too it, it means not, uh, not being terribly engaged with what a lot of people would call identity studies of one kind or another. What would that be? And why, why are you not necessarily a practitioner? Well, uh, there actually there's quite a specific reason for that. When I was an undergraduate student, I took a course from a very wonderful scholar, a great teacher by the name of David Potter. And the course was on the American character. And that's what made an historian out of me. It was, it was a set of questions that he posed about whether you could say something cogent and responsible and historically documentable about the, the enduring character of American society through time. So that, that's a question that has just deeply fascinated me. So the, my scholarly effort and attention, you might say, has always been drawn to these, these large-scale questions, like to what degree are we the legatees of the revolutionary and the constitutional era? To what extent is the society that Alexis de Tocqueville confronted in the 1830s recognizably comparable to the society we inhabit at the beginning of the 21st century? And I, th I think they are comparable. Rather than honing in, say, on the African American experience in, yeah, or just Andrew Jackson's war with the bank, or those are legitimate topics to be sure. Don't get me wrong, but I've always had an appetite for for larger, more synthetic questions. Is there an American character? Well, I, I think there's a bundle of things that have to do with the the porous, disarticulated, free, open character of our society, which is among the reasons why the West is so often taken to be the most characteristic of American regions, um, that uh, distinguish us from other societies. We've had more space in which to operate, both metaphorical and physical space. We've had more choices in our lives and as a society. 
Sometimes the, the choices we face are delusory. We think we have a choice when we don't, but we indulge ourselves in that fantasy nonetheless. So I've been actually I'm trying to write a large synthetic book about this, and one of the titles I'm playing with, although I don't think this will be the ultimate title, is The Americans Are Choosing People. I think we, as a people, over time, we've had more choices in our individual lives and in our collective life uh, than is given to most peoples in most societies. You talk about the grand narrative. Here we go here. This is a grand narrative, won the Pulitzer Prize. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Um, about 11 years in the making while you were teaching, you were working on this? Yes, I, I did have this day job, which is called teaching. <laughs> uh, so, but this was my, this book was my principal project, scholarly project, for about an 11-year period. And so much has been written about this, this era. What did you feel that you had to bring new to the table in terms of scholarship? So what I thought I could do somewhat fresh uh, approaching this period was to focus less on what were the historical antecedents of the Great Depression or the New Deal or World War II and more what were their consequences. So I tried to write the book with an eye uh, to the, the future. What, what, what were the consequences and, and the effects of these great events on American history? All, any one of them taken in isolation, it seems to me, is deeply formative. Depression, New Deal, World War II. And it's an interesting analytical question. Which of them was the most formative or in what combination did they actually give us the society that we uh, have. Uh, Winston Churchill in August 1945, at the end of World War II, the day after the Japanese signaled their intention to surrender, <clears throat> he gave a marvelous speech on the floor of Parliament, and he, uh, in that, in that, it was a speech about what, it, what will be the consequences of this great struggle that has now come to an end. And there's one sentence in that speech that just leapt off the page at me, off at me when I read it. Not least of all because he used the United States as a plural noun, something we haven't done in. American English since the Civil War. He said, the United States stand at this moment at the summit of the world. That was a true statement, emphatically true statement in August of 1945. It had not been true before World War II. World War II transformed utterly this country's relationship to the whole global system. Well, before we go back and explicate that a little bit, do we still stand at the summit, do you think? I think insofar as any single country stands at the summit of the world, yeah, we can still lay claim to that, uh, for better or worse. Um, there's plenty of argumentation about the meaning of that statement. But yes, I think there is, there is no, has been no other country for the last half century plus that has loomed so large in the world's consciousness and has had such effect on global affairs as the United States has. Talk about the legacy that you were focusing on, what, what will be the legacy of this era. People point to the New Deal almost in distaste, a lot of people, and saying this is the era of big government, this is what set us on, us, on our way to bloated government. Um, your thoughts on that, is that, a, is that fair? No, I don't think that's fair. Um, I think the New Deal has become a kind of a talisman or a marker for political argument. And that's been true for two or three generations. And its historical reputation has thereby been tremendously distorted. Uh, readers of my book, I think, will understand if they read it with reasonable care that one of the points I try to make is how modest were the set of New Deal reforms that were put in place in the 1930s and how scrupulously careful the New Dealers were to do minimum possible disruption to inherited laws, inherited ways of doing business, inherited institutions. So for example, we have one of the very few old age pension systems in the world that is self-financed entirely out of employer and employee contributions. In almost all the other countries that we would compare ourselves with normally, those kinds of programs are financed out of general Treasury revenue, central government revenues. And Roosevelt insisted, no, we, that is not a, an American system. We're not going to have that kind of thing here. We're going to make people pay for it th throughout their working career. It will make their employers contribute. But we will not finance old age pensions out of general treasury revenues. That's just one out example out of many about how careful the New Dealers were to uh, align the reforms they put in place with inherited ways of doing business. Conservative in some ways, then, you would say. Yes, I think that it's, that's a proper word to use. If by that we mean cautious, incremental, not radical, not transforming utterly ways of uh, inherited ways of doing things. What was so interesting to me when I, when I read the book was that how little government had been involved in federal government, I should say, in, in people's lives up until then. Um, so it was a radical change and departure then. Uh, the government had really, people were actually kind of passive 
uh, in, yes. in some respects when the depression came around and they weren't expecting the government to bail them out of no, everything. That's right. That's right. The, the, uh, Calvin Coolidge, who had been president in the 1920s, of course, once said that if the federal government went out of business tomorrow morning, the average American wouldn't even notice for probably six to eight months. And with the exception of the Postal Service, which of course was a federal enterprise, uh, that was a pretty accurate statement. That the federal expenditures as a percentage of gross domestic product in the 1920s, through the Hoover administration, were about 3%. Uh, in the post-World War II era, they've run it around the 20% range. So there's just a rough and ready index of how much larger the role of the federal government has been in our lives. Uh, but a lot of that, of course, has been military spending and things that weren't directly the product of the New Deal. When I was growing up, Roosevelt, as other presidents are when you read the history textbooks as a kid, but Roosevelt in particular was on a pretty high pedestal. And um, one of the, one of the uh, things that your book does is respect his accomplishments, but also show in very real ways how he manipulated the American people, the press, uh, other institutions of government to get what he wanted, and in some very sorry instances, as we know, with the boat carrying the refugees from uh, Europe trying to get in, turned that boat away. This is a very, very complex individual, a very powerful man who um, I think you said he had a willful self-delusion, and yes, yeah. uh, that, that self-delusion helped him and hurt him. Yes. Well, I, I actually use that phrase in part in connection with his, the way he treated his disability. So he was unable to walk unaided after uh, his bout with, uh, with uh, polio in the early 1920s. And I think like a lot of uh, people with disabilities of my acquaintance, they, and he amongst them, adopt a kind of a, a form of healthy denial about their own uh, handicap or own disability, and that's what enables them to cope with the world. I think it's a very healthy thing in many ways, but it also, in Roosevelt's case at least, it at least kind of opened a channel for him to delude himself about and be in denial about some other uh, much more important political issues. But still, too. in your view and other historians' view, second only to say Abraham Lincoln in terms of our presidents? Well, historians poll themselves every few years, uh, or somebody polls them, about who they think are the outstanding presidents. And consistently, Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt show up in the one and two, numbers one and number, number one and number two positions. And, and Hoover, really, too, again, it corollary to what I was saying, you know, we were taught that Hoover was just, uh, got us into the mess that we were in, that he was just incompetent. You read your book and you see this is a, a bright individual. Um, uh, Lots of talents, was a humanitarian, just yes. could not cope in the moment for, with yeah. what was happening. He was the wrong person for that time, yeah. but, but not uh, a dupe and not a stupid individual. No. Uh, he, he was arguably one of the most intelligent and best educated, well-informed people ever to live in the White House. I grew up in a household. Uh, my parents were deeply affected by the Great Depression. My father was unemployed for seven years in the 1930s. Uh, and I grew up in a household where the Depression was called, colloquially, around the dinner table, the Hoover Depression, which now I understand was this grossly unfair. And Hoovervilles and yes, things like Hooverville. that. Yes, Hooverville. One of the biggest Hoovervilles was in Seattle when I was a kid. My parents used to talk about it. But the um, uh, Hoover actually tried to counterpunch the Depression as well as I think any president could have, given the situation he inherited, and by the situation I mean the size of government, the character of government, the, their knowledge of what actually was happening to them at this time. No, nobody in 1929, 1930, and I would say even for much of 1931, knew that they were entering the thing that we know historically as the capital G, capital D, Great Depression. They thought this was a familiar economic downturn and there were ways to cope with this. Well, that, now let's bring it forward. Um, we do know kind of what we're sitting in. Obviously, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, you know, there's this phrase that's always said: "This is the the the, the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression." Um, where are we relative to that period of time? Um, if we kind of equate where we are in our downturn. Yeah, good question. I, I like I like the way you formulate the question because the particularly when President Obama was elected and inaugurated in the spring of 2009, <clears throat> there was a rash of commentary out there in the, in amongst the commentariat about how, uh, comparing uh, Fra Franklin Roosevelt and uh, Barack Obama. It was a very natural thing to do. They're both uh, 
aspirationally transformative liberal democratic presidents coming into office following the conservative presidencies that were thought to have been failed in some ways and facing a great economic crisis. But the, the fact is that Frank, when Franklin Roosevelt took office in the spring of 1933, the Great Depression was almost four years old. When Barack Obama took office in the spring of 2009, the Great Recession, if we date it from the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008, was only a few months old. So if we really want to compare the two crises at comparable po points in their respective cycles, uh, the fall of 2010 is comparable to roughly the fall of 1931. And 1931, September of 1931, is when Great Britain goes off the gold standard. And then the world begins to understand that this crisis that is now falling down upon the heads of everybody is unprecedented, greater in scope and scale and velocity and likely duration than anything ever, anybody has ever seen. So if we really want to take the historical comparison seriously, we should compare ourselves in the fall of 2010 to the United States in the fall, and the world, in the fall of so, uh, two, 1931. Kind of depressing. Yeah. Well, it, it, is, it is and is not depressing. Uh, I believe that uh, a lot of the policymakers in both the outgoing Bush administration and the incoming Obama administration actually knew some history and took some lessons from the history of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And among the things that they learned, and I don't know if they'd studied it carefully, Ben Bernanke had, he's a student of the Depression, a careful scholar of the Depression, but others I think had absorbed it uh, osmotically, you might say. But they absorbed a lesson that government can't stand by and hope that a crisis on this scale will correct itself, that there has to be some very vigorous counterpunch from the public sector uh, to offset the downward cycle, both in terms of employment and in terms of the stability of financial institutions and so Some on. Some have said he's not doing enough in terms of, uh, well, like uh, Robert Reich, I think, just had a, an a op-ed about he needs to build government up, more, more government programs. Yes, well, and Paul Krugman has been making mm -hmm. this point for a long time. I think historians will debate into the future the, the accuracy of that, depends what the future holds. But uh, the stimulus package and the, and the Bush uh, bailout of financial institutions, those were vigorous steps measured by historical standards. For, I can put a number to this. The biggest New Deal uh, deficit, the biggest that it ever ran was in 1937, and it was a little over 5% of GDP. That's the biggest, okay, 5% deficit. The deficit this year is going to be about 13% of GDP. So we're already into a realm that the New Deal never knew in terms of the scale of response to this crisis. Your book is called Freedom from Fear because you believe the greatest legacy of this era is that it kept people secure yes. and kept them free of fear. But you have some very interesting words at the, at the end of this book. Some have called them second thoughts, things that people really need to think about in your view it was supposed to be the war to end all wars, it was supposed to be the, the good war. And you really take a pause at the end of this to reflect and say, folks, we were still treating some people really, really poorly during this time. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Well, there is a, a great folkloric uh, mythology about the good war and the greatest generation and the mood of self-congratulation about World War II set in during the war and endured for two generations or more after the war. In fact, it's still very deeply rooted, I think, in our national memory. And I don't mean to deny any of that. I think as wars go, big qualifier, it was a pretty good war for our society. Not least of all because we didn't fight it in anything like the level that other countries did. Uh, the, the, the cost to us, both material and human, to achieve the victory that we did was way less than uh, many other countries paid. Uh, that's among the reasons why it was a good war for this society. But yeah, I was trying at the end of the book there to offset a little bit or to make people think, uh, pause a bit as you say, and maybe temper that self-congratulatory mood to remember the Japanese internment, which was a pretty shameful episode by anybody's standards, uh, and uh, the situation of African Americans during the war, which was also uh, not, uh, didn't conform to the, to the good war kind of a definition. No, no, vir virtually no blacks inducted into the armed forces were allowed combat roles, for example. Um, that, that's actually a worse showing than World War I or the Civil War, where blacks did have combat roles in large numbers, but not in World War II in any significant numbers. And that, that's, that's another shameful chapter, I think. I'd be remiss in not asking you about some other par one other parallel that you've spoken uh, quite a bit about recently, and that is about the military then and now. Um, you are deeply concerned that there's a chasm between civilian life and military life in this country. Um, that 
is pr quite problematic in, in, in your view. And one of the things you'd like to see are, uh, the ROTC back on the Stanford campus, it looks like that is proceeding along. But in a nutshell, describe for our viewers what your concerns are. Well, my basic concern is that we have evolved a, a level of disconnect between civil society and the military that for this country is unprecedented in the modern era. In World War II, we took 16 million people into service, most of them draftees, in a country of roughly 130 million people. So what's that? Something like 11 or 12 percent of the populace was in the armed forces. Today is less than 1 percent of the populace <coughs> is in the armed force. The active duty force is 1.5, 1.6 million personnel, and we're a country of 300 million people. So, and, and it's an all-volunteer force. And though we worry, and Secretary Gates worries these days about the cost of the, the Pentagon budget, the size of the Pentagon budget, the fact is, relative to the size of our economy, the Pentagon budget is actually quite small. It's about 5 percent of GDP. In World War II, it was 40 percent of GDP. In the Cold War, it was 10 percent of GDP. And we had a conscript force in World War II and through much of the Cold War. It was impossible for this society to ignore what the military was being told to do and asked to do and how it was being used and so on. We felt it. We felt it in our homes. We felt it in the economy. Today we don't. And I spent uh, a week at the Fort Lewis, Washington observing the R Army ROTC encampment uh, two summers ago. And the dinner table conversation every night amongst the senior officers running that program revolved around a question, a rhetorical question that they kept asking me and each other repeatedly. And the question was, how can it be that the Army is at war but the country is not? And that sums up what I'm trying to get at here, is the military is engaged on the front line and they're giving blood and life and effort and service and so on, and the civilian society hardly feels it. No taxes have been raised. Uh, many people don't know anybody who's in the war. That's right. Um, we, do you we, think we can deploy the military as a society with heart, without breaking a sweat. Do you think there should be a draft? I don't think there should be a draft, and there's a practical consideration there. We wouldn't know what to do with the draft army today on the scale of the Cold War force that we had or World War II force. If we had a draft on the scale of World War II, we'd have 32 million people under arms. And what would we do with a force that size? And what would the extraction of that much labor from the civilian economy do to us? So we don't need that kind of thing. But I do think we need mechanisms that bring civil and military sectors more closely into contact with one another. I think maybe that means a lottery where everyone is exposed to service or the possibility of service, even though we know that the actual force will remain approximately its present size. And I do think, since you mentioned it, I'll go back to it, that uh, institutions like mine, Stanford University and other so-called elite uh, private universities need to bring ROTC programs back to their campuses. It's just one modest way in which Civilian, leader, civilian institutions which pride themselves, like Stanford does, on training the next generation's leaders will also be training leaders for the United States Armed Forces. Or potentially mandatory service in this country where you get to choose you I, know, the military, the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps? I, I don't like the word mandatory. I, I'm enough of a libertarian that it just uh, kind of raises my hackles to think that we can obligate people to service abs in this country, in our society, absent an existential threat. Uh, I don't think we're at that level yet, so I, I just I don't like the word mandatory. You mentioned a little bit that you say you're enough of a libertarian. Um, what is the role of the historian in terms of taking sides, if you will, or uh, you know we see a lot of commentators that are historians now. Uh, is is uh, Obama doing a good job or not? Um, you were one of the several hundred, I think, histor historians and other people who signed a. Uh, a letter opposing the impeachment of Clinton. Um, is this, a, you know, is it okay for historians to wade into public policy and political issues? Well, I hope so. Uh, I make a bit of a distinction about what I do in my classroom and what I do as a citizen. Uh, I try to be scrupulously nonpartisan in my own classroom. I think my job there is to teach students how to think historically, not to teach them what to think about in a, a given historical episode. Uh, but I think when I, when I write for more general public or take part in public discussion in our society at large, then I think I bring a little bit different orientation to the task. And I think it's proper for historians to tell their fellow citizens what the study of history might explain to us about this or that or the other circumstance we face. Uh, history is not a science. It's not a bench science. We're not laboratory uh, 
scientists. We can't go into the laboratory and insert one historical var variable or extract another one and get some kind of result. We can only argue by analogy and by comparison, and we can give people perspective, but we can't predict the future. That's History simply can't do that. Darn, huh? <laughs> Darn. <laughs> um, as we wrap up, I do want to ask you about the Bill Lane Center for the American West that's at Stanford. You're one of the co-directors of that. And um, what are your priorities? Because there's a lot of centers that study the American West. Well, we, the Bill Lane Center for the American West is named for Bill Lane, who gave us our founding gift. Uh, he was, of course, part of the, the family that published Sunset Magazine for two generations. Uh, Sunset Magazine is an, as iconic a symbol of the distinctiveness of the West as I think you could find out there. So it's very appropriate that uh, we have that connection with uh, Sunset Magazine. But we, we aim to make Stanford a good regional neighbor and citizen and make it a place where the people can look to for understanding the Western region, past, present, and future. We have a lot of historical interests, but we have a lot of present and future-oriented policy interests as well. We have a major research project underway now on water in the West. Uh, we have another one uh, underway on the rural West, which we think is something that's very badly misunderstood in the coastal and urban parts of the region. In what way? People just don't understand at all that how different the terms of life are in the Central Valley of California or in the Intermountain West as compared with San Diego and San Francisco and Seattle and so on. Uh, the interior West is just a, it's a different world from the coastal affluent suburban uh, coastal cities. So uh, we have another project uh, underway on California constitutional reforms since we're located in California, but that's part of a larger project to stay engaged with political uh, reform in the Western region as a whole. Uh, so we have a lot of things that uh, look to the problems that the region faces and we're trying to bring the resources of Stanford University and through Stanford larger scholarly uh, resources to bear on addressing them. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk with me and by proxy our viewers. I appreciate that very much. Congratulations again on the Pulitzer. I know it's been a while ago, but congratulations are always in order when you win a prize like that. You're on the Pulitzer board yes. yourself, so you get to help make those decisions for future uh, authors. You know, we, we call it sprinkling the fairy dust. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it's a tough job because there's a lot of great writers out there. So thank you for taking well, the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate you. it. My pleasure. That was Professor David Kennedy, who teaches history at Stanford University. If you'd like to know more about him, watch this program again, or view my other conversations from the Sun Valley Writers Conference over the years, go to our website. That's also where you can learn more about the conference, and I thank the organizers of that event for finding time in Dr. Kennedy's schedule for this interview. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Please join us same time next week. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.